Welcome to the SDG 360 Thinking Lecture. It is my privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Professor Lori Dupreet Brown, the Director of Global Health and Human Ecology. For those of you who might be less familiar with Lori's unique journey, here's a glimpse. Lori served in the Peace Corps in Honduras and folds degrees from Yale College, the Harvard School of Public Health, and the Harvard Divinity School. She has extensive experience working in Latin America and leading initiatives in Africa. Lori has also provided quality improvement training in India, Nepal, Thailand, and Pakistan. Her work has contributed to strengthening health and so social service programs and fostering connections and understanding across borders. Lori is an educator, researcher, writer, and an advocate for equity, especially the well-being of women and children. She has been driving her force between the 4W Women and Well-Being Initiative, the University Alliance, and the Global Health Institute. Much of her work centers around addressing gender-based inequity and urban challenges within the UN Sustainable Development Goals Framework. As the Director of Global Health and Human Ecology, Lori plays an important role in supporting a community of global scholars and the School of Human Ecology and beyond. Today's event is part of the Merging Initiative. With this event and many more to come, we would like to foster a more robust community. All of us here today are part of the community. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lori Dupreet Baum as she shares her insight on using the SDGs to tackle the pressing challenges facing local governments and communities. Three pillars that shape the human experience, economic, social equity, and, and the environment. And so that is that sweet spot is really where the sustainability work is. So this, you know, what are the origins of this SDG 360 thinking? I am someone who always has issues with novelty because I, you know, someone in philosophy class taught me once all the great thoughts have already been thought. I really believe that. Um, but for me, starting to think this way began when I was trying to, I was working on this global health text and I wanted to be, I wanted it to be a whole of society, health and all policies oriented textbook. I wanted to talk about food. I wanted to talk about rights. And I started thinking, um, at that time, beginning to work here as well, and thinking about socio-ecological thinking, very particular and typical of, of human ecology, where you think about these nested, you know, layers of well-being. And so two, two models, um, one is very sim similar to the donut that you might be familiar with, where we think about pressure on, you know, pressure on natural systems to meet our needs. And that light blue area is, I call it the, um, the ecosystem capacity that's available to support life and create a safe space for planetary well-being. Some of the articulations of it, the, the actual donut talks about a safe place for humanity, but we were thinking broadly of all life forms by then. And so it, it's the same kind of conceptual model, but you're thinking about biodiversity and other, other um, built-in natural systems as well. And you have these planetary thresholds around it. And then this other kind of nested model has to do with really what I would call vital signs, right? We know what vital signs are when we go to the doctor for the individual. And there are vital signs for the human population. Um, and also the sustainable development goal metrics can be considered a set of vital signs for the planet. And so, um, though, and then you have obviously these planetary vital signs in the planetary health thresholds. So all these kinds of data and layers making connections between those was of interest and some kind of a holistic way of you know using radial thinking with some conceptual framework could help you to um, see things you might not miss, to understand co-benefits, to catch unintended harms, and to do clear thinking. And you know, I hypothesize that this is true for experts as well as you know practitioners, um, because experts have the strength that they're experts, but often they're focused, they're specialists. So they're getting breath out of it, where people who might have breath are getting, you know, dipping into specialized detailed issues um, and evidence, you know, realizing the need for evidence base. So they're getting different things out of it, but broad thinking needs to complement um, 
you know, either political action or kind of expert research in order to really do the transdisciplinary work that we need to do. So, um, you know, the first, first articulation that I came across of this holistic thinking is WHO, this is, you know, really soon after the SDGs came out, WHO thought about how to center health and show the interconnections with each and every one of the other, other 16 F SDGs. And another, another great one, I, um, again, this is a 2019 um, article by Ramirez and et al. And all, at all um, looking at urban health and how you could think about health and all policies, really exactly what I had been thinking about. And they did a really beautiful graphic that links all the sub-targets of those 169, the ones that are health and places them. So you can start having still complicated and still maybe too complicated, but a less complicated way to be holistic with the SDGs because there is this systematic um, linking the sub-targets that are relevant from each goal. So you might be working on you know, a particular challenge. Say you're trying to address, um, address um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna think, well, I have some examples later, so I won't give it now, but here they put urban health in the middle. And no, some things don't have a lot to do with urban health, but you could find something from almost all of the SDGs that related to urban health, with, which helps you to create advocacy for that topic and also to do some nuanced work and maybe make your work more efficient with this kind of discovery of, you know, synergies. Um, I've had a lot of thought partners since 2018 on this work. Um, and the Global Health Institute um, is, you know, I was working as an associate director for GHI when I started it. I've been doing systems thinking and implementation science and quality improvement. And actually, uh, Jonathan Patz is here and he'd often say, what, but what's the 2.0? You know, how are you bringing the bigger picture in? And the 2.0 ended up being combining that systems thinking and implementation science thinking with the SDGs as a framework. Um, I've worked with the university year and in classes, um, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network um, hosted a webinar, UN Habitat, a couple of different universities, Harvard School of Public Health in their, in their quality improvement um, training program, University of Guadalajara, and then a bunch of, of um, consortium of universities for global health will be doing a session on that on their virtual webinar this year. And then a bunch of units from UW. This is a you know, great human ecology, um, carrying the water as usual for me, but also with um, the Data Science Institute, the Mayor's Innovation Project, do it. Um, and, and especially University, Al uh, University Alliance. And so it's, it's kind of been exciting to, to work with so many partners. I'll show you some of the work of my amazing grad students in SOHI later. So. Um, so a couple of publications, publications that are already kind of out. Um, we have a recent one that describes application to local governments that really goes through the five steps in detail. And then another article with Carrie McAndrews where we took the same model and we looked at transportation policy, complete streets, and we did a 360 analysis and that is going to be published in the public works management and policy. And again, we worked with leaders from transportation departments in 12 cities. They got insights. They, they saw connections that they didn't see before. They were experts being asked to take this broad look. And so it was encouraging because in some ways, if, if people who use the model don't get insights, then that, that was the whole point, to see things that you don't see and find your blind spots. And so far, it's been working. So um, I don't think the SDGs are a perfect model. I have critiques of it. And I'm totally like with the program of implementing them, I'll be first in line in 2023 when people are saying, oh, what should we revise? What should be the next 15? But it's it's a great model. There's global consensus. And it, it it's, it's, you know, it's a vision a, a, of the social good that we really need right now. I was just telling students in class the other day, we've always had really difficult challenges. You know, we did when I was your age, but we didn't always have the SDGs. So in that sense, you know, there, there, is, um, there is some silver lining to all of these things. So here are, here are the five ways, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about them. But the first thing is, it doesn't really work to talk about the SDGs without local examples. Um, if you can't establish re relevance, urgency, and consensus um, in that way, you're not going to be successful. And a lot of times, 
you'll see people very be very judgmental. You know, you go into a small town, people don't care about the world. Well, you know, they've got a lot going on and it, it more should be on us to make it relevant and then connect people to the world like through that journey of first seeing the localness. So I, I like to take a step back and question ourselves when we have those interactions. I think this goes a long way. Um, and then there's a really powerful tool. It's, it's surprisingly the most powerful one so far has been this notion of crosswalking the SDGs with existing city plans or sustainability plans. It, it's very easy to go in and say, ha, look at that. They didn't even mention the SDGs. Well, every, but no one likes to know it all, right? You're much better off going in and looking at the plan and seeing what's there because very often they might not have mentioned the UN or sustainable development goals, but there's a whole bunch of ways where they're already doing the work. And then you can kind of say, look what you've begun. You're on the train. Here's some low hanging fruit from you. Let's move forward. The, the political, um, vulnerability that people have when they're on a short-term re-election cycle. They can't afford the bad story of admitting them they did something wrong. You're much better off starting, you know, with this positivity as long, you know, as long as you truthfully can. And a lot of times you can. Um, and then there's a big movement to do voluntary local reporting. I'm not going to go into that now because so many other players are doing such great work. I just rely on that. But the idea is even though something like these declarations, millennium declarations or the SDGs, they're not binding. And so a way that you can create accountability is by cities, nations, or especially cities are stepping up and saying, we're going to voluntarily report on these. And then suddenly you create a culture of accountability about it. And it sort of becomes binding in, in that other way, using soft power to advance the SDGs in your city and beyond. And New York City and some others have been leaders on that. And then this SG360 analysis is kind of a methodology, a stepwise methodology that I'll say something about. And then there's some also some great tools um, for equity and inclusion. You might be wondering, oh, darn, I have a little. You might be wondering, is there an app for that? Yes, there is. Thanks to the um, Data Science Institute and do it. I'm not talking about the app today, but it's just about ready and it's been tested by some of our students. You'll see some of the graphics. So a lot of what I'll, the, a lot of what I'm talking about today is about SDG 11, and this is looking at sustainable uh, cities and human settlements, making sure they're inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Now, when you look at 11.1, which is supposedly a, a, a sub goal. You got housing. That's where you find housing in the SDGs. One of my thoughts would be I would put housing, you know, higher. I mean, housing probably should be its own SDG and all that it's implied in, in having a home, right? And then number two is transportation systems. Again, like 11.2, transportation could have been an SDG. Um, you've got planning, you've got preserving cultural and natural heritage. And that means very different things in urban settings and in, in rural settings. Um, green and public spaces, and then rural and urban link, link, linkages so that cities are understanding their role in terms of, you know, interdependent positive dynamics in, in, in larger systems, disaster risk, risk management, and also financial and technical support for resilient buildings. So it's a whopper. It really is. And um, you can really connect people to it, connects to health, it connects to climate action. It connects to, you know, many things that are that are very important. In terms of the global human ecology framework, I want to step back and say, while I'm talking about local government in this article and in this work, um, the, the 360 thinking is actually a whole of society or network of networks approach. And that's what we're doing. So you could do the same thing in these different kinds of organizations. Here you have the model that we use in human ecology where you have civil society, states and private sector. There's so much going on in the private sector. It, it puts me to shame that the, that the you know, that, that they're ahead, but they are. Um, and then civil society where, where you have all kinds of social organizations from activist groups to churches, um, and then the state organizations. Now, none of these spaces are particularly vir virtuous or, or you know, vicious. It, they are what they are. So remember that just because something is a civil society organization, you know, they might they might be the organization to end all rainbows. You know, that, so we have to remember that 
like things that we consider positive and negative for social development help in all these spaces. So the, the NRA that's promoting, you know, gun ownership is in civil society along with the NGOs that are trying to have gun, have gun control, say. So it's just a, a way of thinking about spaces and the SDGs can work there. The idea of a network of network approaches, I think it reflects back to that slide I showed you. I'm, I'm working with a lot of, lot of networks because my goal is to build capacity within all of those networks. So um, SDSN, the EPIC network, the ICLE network, they're, they're, they're groups that support cities and universities with technical assistance. And if you can build a capacity there, you can have a lot of impact. And I think that's appropriate for a university entity to think about you know, building networks and working through networks. Uh, consortium of Universities for Global Health is also a network. So that's kind of um, how, how I'm hoping to build. So I, I mentioned the value of local stories and I'm just gonna show you a couple. Here's an example from some students at Occidental College where they're using the SDGs to talk about equity during decarbonization, but they're linking it to some other things. So climate action is an obvious one and it should be there, but pulling more people into the movement, yeah, there'll be decent jobs too. And sustainable cities and communities, they probably should have health there and, and didn't, right? Um, another another example from some human ecology students, they they worked to improve night and weekend access at the river food pantry. They created a, a system where people could um, sign up and come and get food instead of like having to wait till Monday. And, um, you know, they've ta we've tagged that with SDG2 so that they're they're part of a, a governance conversation. And sometimes people, they can think, oh, the SDGs, they're about global things like clean water and sanitation. Isn't that about India? Um, no, in a word, right? And so you can think with images and messages, you can make the point that it is about here and now. And when you think about, you know, the, the lead in the water, the challenge that we have all over the state, and you have cities like Milwaukee saying, yes, we have a plan. In 30 years, we'll have changed all the pipes. You know, it's it, we have challenges related to water and sanitation right here in the U.S., this crosswalking of the city plans is kind of matrix thinking. And this is an example from New York City where they have their strategic pillars and they've mapped the SDGs that are relevant there to, to create, you know, to tell the story. Hawaii has done some amazing of the matrix planning in this way as well. They have statewide plan and they have, um, and they have also the, a citywide plan. Here's Madison's city plan. And Madison um, is ranked of the top 100 of the top largest cities in the U.S., the top 100. Madison ranks number five in its score on SDGs. Doesn't mean we don't have work to do, but it does mean that we, we have a platform for leadership. And this is the city plan. Um, at the time when we did this, which is a while ago now, there wasn't broad awareness about the SDGs in, in Madison city government. They weren't referring to it. Um, and our students did, and the picture speaks a thousand words. Our students did this crosswalk, which showed the components of the plan. And they're able to say, look how, look how far ahead you are. You are, you know, you're moving. And it created a lot of positive momentum and led to some other more detailed projects that I'll share. But this is a very simple visualization that they were able to do before we had an amp. Um, probably a three hour exercise to do that well. And then you can, you know, you can give a city or a town something really specific of how they're doing. And I'll, I'll share some examples of more recent students in a minute. Um, with the voluntary local reporting, I think I already covered, and here's some examples of some cities that are doing it. There are more now, but these are the ones that, that started out. And there's quite a few cities that are working on localizing the SDGs. And I think one thing that when, when we say localize, you know, part of it is making sure that the U.S. realizes, you know, that we need to practice this in our own city. So that's one way of thinking about localizing. But around the world, the SDGs in many places have stayed at the level of national plans without localizing in the other way, moving down to regions and cities. Well, the president doesn't decide where the trash gets thrown or, you know, making these transportation decisions and so forth. So localization doesn't mean, 
you know, local to global the way we often think. It also means decentralized to the smaller forms of government that are making a lot of decisions that impact resilience and sustainability. Um, then the 360 analysis is this, uh, a, it's a system science kind of approach that is sort of stepwise. And I'll just walk you through really briefly what it is. There's, there's a more complicated um, sort of eight step process where you, first you say, you know, what's the primary SDG? You put it in the middle and you look at those sub goals really carefully. And then you say, what, what's the critical cluster that I need to be working on? And you pull in those other SDGs. I often end up at the nexus of 11, three, and then five and 10 because of my work. So you've got equity, health, you know, community and so forth. But what, what happens once you have a map like this is the, you can, you can collectively identify co-benefits and synergies that could get broader support for what you're trying to do. But you also can kind of build trust by error-proofing processes. Now, you might not want to be like, I don't know if I want to criticize my nice plan. When people make a car for you, they crash test it before they sell it to you, right? And there's a reason why they do that. So when you have social programming, you also want to have the courage to really crash test it, make sure it doesn't do harm. And then if you find something and fix it, you, you can be transparent about that. So that's called error-proofing in engineering terms. And this is a great tool for making sure you don't create inadvertent harm in another realm when you're trying to solve one problem. And then the third thing is there are some times when, unfortunately, even though you might have net benefits, they're going to be distributed in ways that some, there's winners and losers on that. So rather than skirting that under the rug, if you want to, if you want to be in this for the long term, you can really use this to be explicit about trade-offs and then make the compensatory measures right at the start. Choose a different strategy or make the compensatory measures so you, you establish yourself as a moral and ethical leader that can be trusted because the, you know, the maybe getting by you know, multimodal transport might be a lot easier than um, than something else that you need to do that you didn't expect to. So if you're a mayor or a local government official, you you want to have that kind of honesty and integrity that has a long shadow in the good way. So the SDG 360 thinking is really kind of an implementation science approach. And, um, you know, this is is a really good match. Some some of the scientists that I've worked with have said, oh, that is a great way for me to just um, demonstrate broader impacts when I'm writing a grant. They always have to have a section where they're showing like these overflow impacts they'll have. You know, I can use that in that way. So it's um, it's a tool um, that is really useful for everybody. That is kind of a radial approach. I also like this pinwheel style. And this is easier if you're working with a group and whiteboarding and stuff um, because you can move stickies around. It's hard to draw all those circles. But here you have neighborhoods and housing. And a lot of times we think about that as addressing poverty. If you have a house, it's about someone else. But this is linking neighborhoods to eight different SDGs with linking housing policy. And this was done for, uh, for Madison. The housing team was really impressed and grateful when the students did this analysis because it allows them to build a broader base. And you can just see how, you know, it was pretty clean for the students to, to map it. They'd say what the strategies are, and then they'd explain them over here. So in, in kind of a one-page report, a team can talk about their housing strategy with a degree of sophistication. And normally, they would be taking a 30-page report off the shelf. And, you know, so the visualization and the, the simplicity makes it possible to work across sectors, you know? Um, Laurie, this looks very familiar with what we used to do with health impact assessment. Yes, it's related. And drawing wire diagrams. Yes. Here's the problem. Um, what are the causes of the problem? So is this what happens? Is that, you know, what are the key factors for neighborhood? It's it's not yeah it's not a root cause analysis although you could do that there's a little bit with the complexity theory there's a little bit actually of being a little bit wary about root cause analysis because it's usually there's systemic there's a web of causes as well so this is this is more um, you know you can find the web of causes and possible impacts more easily here but I would think of that methodology. It is in that family of implementation science, quality improvement. Health sciences in general are really way far ahead of doing these kind of 
you know, these kind of things. And so definitely. And in fact, in one of the um, in one of the ways that I present this, I, I use the health impact assessment model as one of the, you know, one of the derivative models, though I didn't hear. But I don't use the language of root cause analysis the way I do in, in health system stuff because they're they're wicked problems and they just have a weird web of solutions and getting people to focus on one cause can can be too myo myopic early on later they can be efficient and say we'll attack that one first but i want them to map the fiber the web of causes which one which can which one can we tackle and then how are we going to gradually get at all of them so yeah it's it's really related all of these things that's why i say there's nothing new under the sun but this um this is easy to pop into whatever process, what I was trying to do here, there's so many different strategic planning processes, um, implementation processes. I wanted to have a tool that could be used in any one of them rather than, okay, you have to buy into like a whole, a whole way of planning to do this. No, actually, whatever way, whatever method you're already using for planning, you can do an SDG 360 as part of it. So it could be part of health impact assessment. It could be part of like someone's hypothesis formulation of special aims for, you know, artificial intelligence research. It's it's a versatile tool in that way, theoretically, with lots of room for improvement. Another, um, another you know, another thing that we've been thinking about, we're having some conversations possibly with doing some collaborations with the Sorbonne and looking at, you know, looking at their situation and their questions, you know, I want to make sure that we're responsive. So we're saying, you know, can 360 analysis help um, integrate and accelerate process when the Paris Agreement is the big conversation that's relevant there? How do we, how do we do a, a both and, and, you know, accelerate things there? Because in some ways, if you did more of centering SDG 13 and more of the web-like interactions, that already happens in the climate agreement. But, you know, there could be maybe some things that would help. Otherwise, don't do it, is my, my thinking. A second question is, um, can 360 thinking be useful with lo local governments in Europe the way it is in the U.S., that suddenly people are going to be willing to be doing this holistic thinking because it's localized? Because the rural-urban divide is also a dynamic in the European context, just like here. So some of the things we're learning might be relevant. And then the third question was, you know, can we collaborate for global social good with leaders from French speaking Africa um, with, with centering those leaders and, and having them, you know, speak to the model. Um, so, well, to be, to be continued. Um, and then here is another type of SDG 360 analysis where it was really guidance on integrating the sustainable development goals in climate change adaptation pro projects. So they are, um, you know, making, making all these correlations in order to help people think about, again, which critical set of sub goals are going to help me with my climate action plan. So again, this was something that was done more generically, that if you were working with uh, an or a, a city on their climate action plan, you'd have some guidance about what sub goals and targets might be useful to them. And you'd have a way of having them talk about, gee, it looks like they've covered like all the SDGs there. And that's, that's kind of a nice jumping off point um, with the idea, obviously when you're localizing, you won't use all of that. That's okay. It's, it's a jumping off point that can, you know, accelerate the conversation. Um, centering equity and inclusion. We have SDG 10 which does that as well as SDG five. And I also have some work um, that is related to critical theory, but very clear, simple questions of how you can talk with communities in ways that move your work toward equity and avoid ways of talking with communi communities that perpetuate inequity, whether racial or other kinds. This is um, Sonali Sanjita Balaji who shared this um, with us a couple of years ago. And it's based on um, an article that I'll just show you quickly in a minute um, that is kind of a critical theory framework. But I, I, all of these, some of these are what you would think, you know, are we analyzing power? Are you inviting different kinds of perspective taking? The one I really like, um, which, which was one that was new for me that I learned from, um, do you integrate a mix of of structural, relational, and healing strat strategies that follow the cultural world views of the community you're serving. 
So it's kind of like, how do you celebrate? Is it in the lexicon of the people that you're with? Like some people dance, some people have a potluck, some people light a candle. Are you paying attention to that? Because that's going to affect the spirit and cohesion of the movement. That was a big aha for me, you know? Uh, it shouldn't have been, but it was. And it's not like I never thought of, you know, doing that. But to ask yourself if you are doing it is a different question. Uh, and then in terms of some of the things that perpetuate uh, inequity. One thing that really perpetuates inequity is off is having describing a problem, thinking it's simple, and not getting into the history of why it's happening. Being a historical leads you to trouble, um, and you know people really need to assume if a simple problem is persisting, it's not simple, and there's a history there, and it's gonna it's gonna um, provide healing just to speak it, and it's gonna help you build community, and then you're going to come up with better, better solutions. So, you know, that's just, and, and actually, um, my students love these questions. They hated this. It was like seven new words they have to learn. And they're like, why are we being so philosophical and, you know, jargony? And I kind of said, you know, you're, you're scholars. So you don't, wanna, you don't need to use these words in community, but you need to know what they mean. You know, it's nice to have a little bit deeper knowledge than what you're using. And then once they, you know, once they learn these terms and thought about it, it was nice to be able to recognize these problems and take action. So, you know, here again, this is this is what um, Sonali simplified, but it's a um, work from Finland looking at critical literacy and ethnocentrism, ahistoricism, I just explained, and uncomplicated solutions. I'm super guilty of that in my early QI days. You know, can't you just... Well, every sentence that starts with can't you just probably should not be finished, right? Um, and then we also did some scholarship here with some gender scholars looking at um, the SDGs and how they could be better. Um, again, I love the SDGs and I think they could be better. And we looked at more emphasis on human rights, more emphasis on indigenous ways of knowing and more emphasis on gender analysis were three things that we we called it um, we called it from a three legged stool to a three dimensional world. This is our three D approach. So if you can take the SDGs and just put on your three D glasses, and everything will be okay. Um, we also have done a lot with um, education, and um, this is you know thousands of students have studied the SDGs at UW. We have been teaching the SDGs to our students since 2010, and it's incredible. And in fact. I've been on webinars where the the person, you know, the person who was like the junior person because they're relatively recently graduated said, oh, you know, I just want to say I, I was a student at UW-Madison and I've studied the SDGs before and all of this, you know, so they're really out there to the point where you run into them. And um, I think that um, continuing to do that at the largest scale we can is extremely important. We really are ahead of other institutions in this regard. Um, here is, um, I'm going to just show, I, I do want to go back because I like that other one. So some of the um, work that we've done, this is work done by Kaylin Ostrowski. This is some of our work that students supported, but usually had a really strong mentor with them. And Noah Cook was an amazing student and he found a mentor in Kaylin Ostrowski and they did this SDG 360 relating to hemp in Wisconsin. We have a tradition of producing hemp there's health benefits, there's environmental benefits. They have a beautiful report that's linked there. And that was just, you know, scholarship combined with, with students rolling up their sleeves. Um, we, you saw the nice work that we did, that the Madison group did. And so that led us to work with the Mayor's Innovation Project to present the SDG model. And I wanna take a pause here to just talk about that conversation because they were nervous about, unleashing this this on them. They're like, they're gonna, they're busy, they're gonna think it's too complicated. They're not interested in the SDGs. They don't know about the SDGs. These are new mayors. What are you gonna say? And I put a lot of thought into it. I was very hepped up about the city plan, as you saw. I love that approach. And it, it I do think it's very good. However, some political scientists in my life um, made me aware that not every mayor is super excited about their city plan. They're done every 20 years and you might find an online city plan. 2023, it has feels new. It could mean it was written in 2003 and that nobody who did it is even on the board anymore. So 
people could have all kinds of different feelings. So I didn't, I, I'm thinking, how, how do I sell this? Here I am. I'm having my test now. There's mayors from, there were, I think, 15 mayors in the room. Are any of them interested? And so I was asking them if they wanted to do follow-up work with us. And first I said, you know, I want to know how you feel about your city plan. And then I said, raise your hands as we go. So you can imagine their logic and you see how you'll see how I was leading them to water a little bit. Um, I don't have a city plan, few people. Um, it sits on the shelf. I got one, but it sits on the shelf. I don't have the resources to implement this city plan that someone else did. Um, I want to take a different direction than my city plan. So people are raising their hands, you know, you're, but you're getting into their imaginary and, and like addressing their worries. Um, I, we have a city plan, but nobody knows what it says. You know, um, I inherited a city plan and now I want to take the lead, but I don't want to go through that whole planning process again. You get a lot of nods on that one. Um, the city plan includes everything and priorities aren't clear. So again, a lot of people are feeling that. We have had a strong city planning process and now people have really high expectations on what we can deliver. Um, I'd like to take ownership of the city planning process so we have clear goals and vision. At this point, everybody's kind of raising their hands. And then, you know, at the end, I put in there, I want to have it all. I want to advance economic prosperity, have social equity and care for the environment. And so it, it takes them where you want to go and shows them that you know what their reality is. I did not mention the UN here yet, right? And I, you know, then... Um, Here's another nice graphic that links cities to a lot of the SDGs and, and the um, UN habitat that we've worked with a little bit um, has, has this model where they have almost like a guiding principle for each SDG, which is a different approach, but I think it's a really good one as well. And you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that you could use that. And you don't, if you wanted to have a conversation and not necessarily dig into the 169 sub goals, you can, you can have people you know, find the interrelations with a conversation. So this could be used for you know, a conversation with community. But um, so I'm gonna share now what some of our students have done um, with these local communities. These are four students who worked with um, Mayor Knapper of um, Maplewood, Maplewood, uh, Missouri. It's a small town outside of St. Louis. And this, these were their, this were the seven strategies of their strategic plan. So the students analyzed and pulled out the strategies. And then um, they, they did this for the mayor and for the city council. So they're explaining the SDGs and the sub goals to the council with this slide. This is what we already know. And then they, and then they kind of showed the crosswalk with a red, yellow, um, green to show them you know where where they're doing well they also and this was using the app they created an sdg wheel um, looking at parks and public spaces and making all the linkages but this allows you it's still a little bit awkward the app but the the apps produces this sort of automatically and it allows you to add images so you know having all these numbers and spheres is not that interesting it needs to have images from the place and and we're starting to figure out how to do that and this is a group that worked in Fitchburg, same kind of thing. They did a crosswalk of the plan and then they did an analysis of transportation. Um, and, and this is Tigered, Oregon, um, same kind of thing. They wanted to be creative. I, I actually really like what they did. Um, they did not use the app. Um, they made up their own thing, but these are the three, the three core principles of Tigered. So they put them in the middle in circles and they drew all these lines and dotted lines to to show the interconnections. Um, and they've been invited back to present at the Tiger board. Now in October, they're gonna be going. They, they the, the cities really loved this work. They had a, a meeting with the mayor's, um, um, mayor's improvement project and, um, and I'm sorry, mayor's innovation project. And at the meeting, they were all talking about how much they loved our, our UW students. So here they did an SDG 360 analysis about, um, about homelessness. And so they create, you know, you have this sense of a house being a home in the middle. You know, my feedback was that you need to have photos from Tigard, but anyway, it's okay. Um, and then they talked about harms to avoid co-benefits and trade-offs. You know, they really did that exercise, right? And, and um, that can be the beginning of, of a conversation for folks. 
So um, we're going to have, so, so this kind of gives you a sense of, um, of what, what the work can look like and how, you know, a really a very simple approach can add clarity. And I think um, clarity is, is actually quite difficult to achieve. It's not just that you know what you're doing, but that you can really explain it clearly so that people are truly on the same page. And in this kind of work, and I've, I've been a local official myself, you know, and I know why it happens, but in this kind of work, you can be at a presentation and people, it's like they're hearing something again for the first time. Getting people on the same page requires a lot of clarity, a lot of repetition and the visualization and really speaking to where people are. Um, so um, I have a few thoughts about how the SDGs, you know, what I would do, critiques of the SDGs, whatever. But first I'm gonna share with you, cause I think you, this is a really fun thing that shows you how you really can make it local. One of the cities that I didn't show you there was Cleveland. We work with the city of Cleveland. Now they've been chosen to do um, a feature project. Los Angeles and Cleveland have been chosen and we'll probably continue working with them. But this is something that was done related to the work in, in Cleveland, not by one of our students, but related to that work. Sustainable development goals. Sustainable development goals. You guys hear the drums good? Does the music sound good? The, the beat? Yeah? All right. It looks good on my end. Oh, I'm recording it too over here. Sustainable development goals. Yo, yo, yo. SDG the best, what up John Guest? I'ma keep it nice and simple, not too complex. My name is Zep, you don't have to peep the bio. I wanna say shout out to Philanthropy Ohio. Larry McGill reps the SDGs, ambit full circle 360 degrees. Deeper out in Cleveland with positive energy. Leave no one behind, economic prosperity. How can we use data to measure progress? Helping people find work so they're looking for jobs less. Vanessa, Delishney, London Community Foundation from Canada, all about unity. Their journey began in 2018 with SDGs, working with the CFC. Active in impact, investing spaces, health and well being with vital conversations. Sustainable development goals, sustainable development goals i think there's 17 sustainable development Starts goals. getting your product, sustainable yeah. development goals that's sdgs that's what it stands for sustainable development goals sustainable development goals sdgs what what sustainable development goals uh. Sue Peters, the Community Foundation of Greater Flint, Michigan, helping with education, leadership, scholarships, long-standing programs. Neighborhoods can grow in the streets like a rose can. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, slumber, get good sleep, maybe go on vacation. Cause you worked hard for quality education, gender equality, water innovation, to make it more clean and help sanitation, affordable energy, economic growth, industry, infrastructure, and more quotes, reduce inequality, sustainable cities, help the playgrounds and parks look pretty, responsible consumption and production, climate action, mother nature's not bluffing, sustainable development goals, sustainable development goals, remember Captain Planet? Sustainable development goals, sustainable development goals, he had a green mother, he was great, sustainable development goals, sustainable development goals, his boss was Mother Earth, sustainable development goals, I guess. See, this is Agua, life before water, or life on land, justice and strong institutions for the fam, partnerships for the goal, strike with intelligence, pure elegance for sustainable development, using new ideas, thoughts rearranged, Vanessa and the vital crew said be the change, Larry showed the slides for the info we're learning, deeper won't stop believing in the journey, systems convening, catalyzing, coordinating, partners connecting and all communicating, so everybody, all the girls and the boys, if you love SDGs, please make some noise. And yo, that is the truth. Actually, right here, you can even come off mute. You can wave your hands. You can go hoop, hoop, and whoop, whoop, whatever you want. Fun, huh? I mean, it really does its job. So, huh? No, no, that's the they, he, I think he did it. 
So the other thing that's really exciting that's happening is that we are getting into some global initiatives with not just translations, but translations and adaptations. So it, it's not enough just to translate, you know, these examples, but to really do the research and find local examples. And Shirtsi's done one for Chinese language with it's a beautiful presentation that hopefully she'll be sharing and we'll be sharing it in some international networks on October 20th. We're presenting a Latin American version to some networks from Epic N, the SDSN, and there's a group of um, cities that ICLE, which is a, an organization of county leaders, is working with in the Americas. So again, network of networks. We'll see what kind of turnout we have, but we'll make it a webinar and then we can we can use it. And that's being done by uh, Dr. Andrea Chavez and Dr. and uh, Gabi Vaca one from the University of Guadalajara and one from the EPIC Network. And then we're working also on an English adaptation. Debbie, who's in the back, has been helping with that. And we have actually colleagues in Bahidar have done, have done some great work there too. So figuring out the strategy on that um, right now. So, um, and then possibly the Sorbonne. So, you know, this is kind of um, in a way a modest approach and in a way like a lot of seeds, you know, spread, spread in different places. Um, Critiques and questioning about the SDGs, if you're going to be all in doing something, you have to be questioning your framework too. Not to not do the work, but to just have integrity and, you know, be looking forward. So, you know, I think um, when I look at some critiques of the SDGs, I would say, I already mentioned, I think housing and transportation are a bit lost and they're really important subsystems and their sectors and local government. So the way governance organizes itself doesn't match. And I think that's too bad. Um, poverty and related metrics, I think, are increasingly problematic. It, it's, it's looking at extreme poverty with, um, I think it's like $1.25 a day, they might have adjusted it, but it's so low that if we think we achieve that, we can have this false sense that we've solved poverty and poverty is so linked with housing that we really need to be using some other metrics. So I would really probably, you know, reframe that a little bit. Um, and then I think I'd love to know what Water at Wisconsin thinks, but when you look at um, SDG 14 and 16, it's really it's it's life on land and then life in oceans. It's really a sea. It's a it's a it's a saltwater seawater thing. Right. So inland freshwater ecosystems are not heavily emphasized. Technically, they're part of life on land because it's like a Leopoldian concept of everything that's in the land. But only like we are the Great Lakes, right? We're the ones should be raising our hands saying, well, there are some lake systems or, you know, in Africa, you have the Great Lakes in Africa. And I, I don't, I, I just worry when I look at those sub goals that we're emphasizing water with SDG 6, like we want to drink it, but we're not really doing enough about inland freshwater ecosystems in what's articulated there. I, I, you know, I would be very interested to talk to, you know, subject matter experts in that. Uh, LGBTQ plus rights are, are not there at all. And it is a it, it is a global issue. People have a right to dignity and to be alive, regardless of what you think their lifestyle should be. And um, that's that's challenging for the UN. There's room for the work, but they don't name the work. And they're trying to be sort of a least common denominator. And when we work with the UN, um, you know, we're accepting that framework. Um, there's certainly language that leaves space for it, um, but it doesn't name the right to be, you know, without harm to yourself with those identities. Um, localization, as I said, you know, that's my jam, this idea that local governments are a lot. It's a big emphasis. Um, I just was at the SDG meetings a couple of weeks ago, and they're really admitting like that they're really just beginning to get down to doing stuff about implementation and they're not sure what to do. And, you know, the national plans and the metrics have taken all the energy and we're halfway through this 30 year thing. As I said, I think demonstration of change could be a faster, sometimes the slow way is the fast way. And I think, you know, in some ways being more local and being more action oriented and then moving toward creating systems to ensure it might have, might have been a better way. Uh, implementation strategies, they, they tell you where you want to be and they don't tell you how you get there. So that's kind of like saying, there's a big dipper, let's go, right? We need to know how to go. We need to know what the proximate endpoints are. I think vision is really important and clarity of purpose is really important, but more on implementation could be there. And then um, when they are, I don't know how to say this well, I've just been thinking about it the last few days because I've had to lecture to students on this topic. 
And basically when you set a goal, if you set a really high goal and didn't meet it, you came just under people like, oh, you didn't meet your goal. If you set your goal here and you pass it, oh, you met your goal. It's like people have to think about what's really happening. And students are rightly, you know, worried, discouraged, scared, don't trust systems, all of these things. And so at some point you have to say, well, when you're on a soccer team, do you say, well, let's just take the games where we're predicted to win? You, you play them all and you try to win them all. And when the odds are against you, you have different strategies, but you you try to win. And that is the situation we are in with sustainable development. We don't know the outcome. We're not going to be, you know, having the luxury of waiting until there's a positive prediction so you can stay on the bench, you know, drink your Gatorade until until you're likely to win. You've just got to get out there and and fight. And we won't probably most I won't see the results in my lifetime. Some of you younger people might, right? But, I, and I think from a civil society and community studies um, lens, I have seen young people in my life, maybe since people who are young in the audience, since you were 15 or even younger, every single institution in society has let you down in some big way, one way or another way or another way. And it doesn't mean, in my mind, it does. we have a lot of work to do to make sure organizations work. And then to keep them working, to keep them from, you know, degrading again, we might have to do that same amount of work, but it would be way better to be doing that work to keep a functional system going than to repair a system. And there's never going to be a day we can rest now the job is done. It's just like, you don't, you don't pump blood into your system and then say, okay, your heart can take a rest now. It doesn't have to be, you know, we got, it just has to keep beating. And so we're going to have to keep doing this work no matter what. But hopefully we can make enough change that the grandchildren, the children, you, you know, your children, you young people here, um, will be working to keep systems working rather than fix broken systems. And, uh, you know, it's a joy to do that because it's part of caring for the earth. It's rewarding and you can you can thrive in the midst of that. And so that's just realistic for just everything about life, you know, to feed your family. It's the same to keep a roof over your head. You gotta, you gotta keep, you know, you gotta maintain things. And so um, the news is there's a lot of work involved in being human. We're incredibly creative beings and um, it's a beautiful world on many days. And, you know, things have always been really hard. Um, we didn't have the SDGs when we were young. So at least you have, you know, you have the SDGs and, there's a movement um, that I think, you know, can have a lot of impact. Um, so that's, you know, not false hope, just kind of gritty hope is you, you got to be. Thank you again for listening to today's SDG 360 Thinking Lecture featuring Lori Dupree Brown. 4W continues to leverage the strengths of UW-Madison to be a conveyor and leading voice in education, applied research and impactful engagement to promote gender equity, global well-being, and the full participation of women in society.